Hello everyone and welcome to the last of today's Tidefest events, The Stories We Tell, a conversation which will discuss writing memoir, how to give voice to those on the margins and how to put your truth on the page. My name is Emily and I'm one of the researchers working on the Tide project. Our work over the last five years has been very deeply involved with these questions about how truth is mediated by memory and experience and how memoir creates history. So this discussion feels particularly pertinent and I'm delighted to be introducing our three speakers. Our first speaker, Nikesh Shukla, is a British author and screenwriter whose work focuses on race, racism, identity and immigration. He edited the 2016 collection of essays, The Good Immigrant, and his debut novel, Coconut Unlimited, was shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award in 2010. His most recent work is Brown Baby, a memoir of race, family and home. He was Tide's visiting writer for 2018 to 19, and we're delighted to have him back today for Tide Fest. Yashika Dutt is a leading anti-caste journalist and the author of Coming Out as Dalit, the winner of India's National Academy of Letters Award. Her work has been published in the New York Times, The Atlantic and Foreign Policy magazine. Tanais is the author of the forthcoming Insensorium and the novel Bright Lines, a finalist for the Centre for Fiction First Novel Prize. They are also the founder of Tanais, a fragrance beauty and design studio in New York City. I will uh, invite the participants to turn their cameras on now and unmute themselves while I turn my camera off. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your discussion and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you so much to Tide. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Ashukla. I was the writer in residence for the Tide project uh, a couple of years ago, and my work with the Tide team was very much about, um, about story archive and migration and um, we, civility and humour, and, um, and ver it was so much of it was about what stories we tell how we how we archive these stories what stories we get to tell as well and i'm really really excited to be in conversation with tanais and yashika about these very issues mostly because you know i'm, I'm a huge fan of both of their work um but also i i'm i don't think that writers such as us ever get to have conversations that are about craft and how we tell those stories um so thank you so much to the tide team for bringing us all together for allowing me to curate this really lovely um thing this really lovely conversation please tweet along um the hashtag is hashtag on belonging and hashtag tidefest um we will be talking about our work uh, we will also be talking about um truth as, as well and i think that is all of my sort of housekeeping stuff that i need to do so just all that's left to do is say hey guys how you doing hi hi Ashika. hi Denise. So happy to be here. Um, you know, it's it's a strange time that we live in, and it has. This is how we have lived in for eighteen months, uh, with no end in sight. But I'm really grateful that we are allowed to have these conversations, especially you know, and, and as we talk, like a writer like myself who never thought would write a book, I get to discuss the craft. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. So thank you. No, no, thank you, and and thank you. Tanae as well I mean you're taking time out from the family holiday so really extra special thank you to both of, I don't know you both are as well um so I guess the first place to start you know as is customary on a zoom in these times how has your pandemic been um how how are things for you at the moment are you are you okay how how has work been for you how has how have things been going and um, we'll start with you T uh, I feel, you know, that after having COVID last year, my perspective on life and death completely changed. Um, I got it pretty bad. And I was writing this memoir throughout that whole time. Um, so I felt myself regressing to some places where I was connecting to my teenage self, my young self, and doing some healing. And I feel like now that the book is done, Mm. that repair is sort of like getting me ready to release the book into the world next February. Um, so uh, it's been a very intense year for me. I, I hope I hope you don't mind me asking the question, but given some of the symptoms of COVID involving a loss of scent and taste, and you were writing so much about scent, how, how was that for you? 
was that? It was, I actually uh, begin the book with that. Um, that's not the part I'm reading, but I lost my sense of smell and it's still compromised to, you know, it's not as sharp, but I think perfuming for a new sense of scent that is developing in the world is another challenge. So I sort of um, found a way to deal with that. And part of the original idea I had was kind of a trip from Bangladesh to India. And that couldn't happen, obviously, because of COVID. So the perfuming allowed me to do that in a virtual way. And I think I kind of found a new reason, a new raison d'etre for being a perfumer is to connect the diaspora dish connection through perfume. I feel like that was something that emerged and I would not have had that without COVID, so. Amazing, thank you. And Yashika, how about you? I've been, I've been good. Um, I did have COVID as well, uh, not very long ago, actually, a couple of days ago, and I was fully vaccinated. So I'm one of those uh, lucky breakthrough infections uh, that everyone's talking about in the US. And um, my family had COVID in April, which was extremely scary. Uh, we know the second wave, the, the so-called second wave, which was badly handled in India. Um, and it was it was a difficult time. Past few months have been challenging. Um, I think I coasted in the first wave last year. I was working a lot, but this year has been um, just dealing with the impact of the, of this uh, disease um, and uh, you know experiencing how real it is. Great, thank you both. So um, we're just going to um, introduce everyone watching to your work. So um, Yashika is going to be reading from Coming Out as Dalit and today you're going to be reading from Incentorium, which is out in February next year. Um, Yashika, would, uh, can, we, can I get you to just introduce the book and tell us a little bit about it and um, please take it away with your reading. Absolutely. So um, this is Coming Out as Dalit. It's a book that I wrote in 2019 in India, and it recently won the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar, which is, um, thank you, which is one of the highest literary honors in India. Um, I wrote it uh, after working as a journalist for about a decade in India and moving to New York and hiding my Dalit identity for a lifetime. And I wrote it spurred by the letter that was written by Rohit Bemala. For those of us who don't know, he was um, a student activist from the University of Hyderabad, and he um, fought till the last breath against caste discrimination, systemic caste discrimination in his university. And he had to pay that with his life. Um, and he had the kind of bravery and courage that I didn't because I was hiding my caste. And after I read that letter, which was the first time I read a Dalit person writing in English, I decided that I needed to do something with all this education that I had acquired. And I decided to launch a website called Documents of Dalit Discrimination, which became into this book. Um, so the book is a nonfiction memoir um, argument for why those who say that caste doesn't exist are wrong and how caste is everywhere around us. So I'm going to read a little bit first from my author's note, and then I'm going to read uh, from the chapter on reservation. For those of us who are following Indian politics, this is a very current topic. But frankly, even as somebody who's only been recently involved in the issue of Dalit civil rights, we are frankly tired of talking about it. So this is the last time I'm hopefully having to say my piece on reservation. Before I started thinking deeply about it, like most of us, I never saw caste for what it really is, the invisible arm that turns the gears in nearly every system in our country. It's been working silently for so long that we have stopped noticing it, even though it exists all around us. Whether we realize it or not, Almost all critical decisions and developments in the country, whether in the justice system, government, or media, are upper caste decisions. And they almost always exclude lower castes or Dalits. 
caste doesn't only come into play with regard to certain issues like manual scavenging, reservation, government jobs, or cow traders. It is part of every aspect of all our lives. What I hope this book will do is let you see how. This is the chapter from, which is called The Argument for Reservation. Through the three years I spent at St. Stephen's, I was worried about people finding about my caste only when the result lists went up on the notice boards and my name was tucked under the SCST category or towards the end of the course when my classmates began discussing how easy it would be for a reserved category student to get into a good MBA college. I stayed silent through most of these discussions because I didn't know how to tell them why that wasn't true. I wasn't entirely sure myself how reservations worked, but I felt deeply ashamed about grabbing the resources that belonged to those who rightly, rightfully deserved them. That was certainly not me. I had internalized the argument that anti-reservationists anti make when they claim that reservations ruin the chances of deserving upper caste people in the college and job market. Of course, I thought they were right to be upset about that. But beyond these few moments of anxiety, my caste didn't bother me too much in college. That would not have been the case had I attended other Delhi University colleges. In most colleges in DU, which is Delhi University, the annual student elections are often criticized for being flashy and dramatic and are heavily backed by student wings of the prominent political parties in India, which is BJP, Congress, CPIM, JDU, ASU, etc. These elections are often fought along caste lines with candidates from certain castes being fielded for certain posts. They have, been they have been criticized for allowing castes to rob the campus of a certain level playing field. These elections are banned at St. Stephen's where I was studying, and therefore students are shielded from the caste-based bullying that is common in several Delhi University colleges during elections and the rest of the school year. The notion that constitutional reservation is an unfair government handout to schedule castes and tribes who obviously don't need it is absurd. It is a corrective measure that reflects the socialist policies of the nation state and is 1,000 years overdue. This idea of undeserving students didn't spring up in a vacuum. It originated and was widely disseminated during two critical events in modern India's history, the Mandal Commission protests of the 90s and the anti-reservation protests of 2006. The All India Institute for Medical Sciences, which is called AIMS in New Delhi, was the main hub for the 2006 protests, and they were widely covered by media channels. I remember watching those broadcasts on television as I saw the action unfold around me in real time in Delhi University. The protests took place in the summer following the release of Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra's blockbuster movie, Rangde Basanti, in late January the same year. In the movie, five easygoing Dell University students turn into activists who lead an agitation against government corruption. The storyline in the movie is cleverly juxtaposed against the narrative of freedom fighters from the 1900s. Flashback, flashbacks of five famous freedom fighters smoothly cuts to present day scenes of the same five actors, which are Amir Khan, Soha Ali Khan, Sharman Joshi, Siddharth Narayan and Kunal Kapoor. They're conspiring to take down a corrupt minister and attempt to justify the actions as patriotic in the larger national interests. Several scenes in that movie were shot in and around Delhi University, including at St. Stephen's. The five actors had spent part of the year touring various Delhi University colleges and the pre-release publicity was intense many months before its release. Unsurprisingly, the movie opened to packed cinema halls 
and became a must watch for all DU students who felt represented on, scene, on the screen. The movie was celebrated for reviving the patriotic spirit in nonchalant early millennials. In this charged atmosphere, when the United Progressive Alliance, which is the UPA government of Manmohan Singh, announced its plan to introduce additional re reservation for OBCs, which is the other backward classes category in April in the same year, Youth for Equality, a student group based in Ames, the same college that I talked about, found it easier to mobilize the usually apathetic students. Cell, phone, cell phones were flooded with text messages urging students to gather at India Gate to stand up for what's right, that is opposed reservation. The message was so effective even then that I wondered, someone who had steered clear of politics, particularly reservation, I wondered if I was neglecting my patriotic duty by not attending these protests. Many students who were away from the, for the summer didn't make it to the actual protests, but the message that quota students have it much easier than everyone else was reinforced. Despite limited participation, these protests, which began when YFE called for a nationwide strike on 13th May 2006, had some impact. Ames was the epicenter and the college administration openly supported the protesting doctors and students, providing them with tents, pillows, mattresses, and water coolers. The protests also spread to the students of IITs, IIMs, and some other medical and engineering colleges. Ames had no more than a handful of protesters, yet they grabbed national media attention by turning away patients and even denying emergency healthcare at one of the most important hospitals in the country. Meanwhile, the pro-reservation protests, which also took place at the Ames campus, were brutally shut down by the police. Since the administration allegedly did not permit any agitations within 500 meters of its campus, they had relaxed that rule for the mostly upper caste doctors and students who were protesting reservation. Anti-reservationists shouted caste slogans. They swept the roads and shined shoes to demonstrate that they were, in fact, the new Dalits. Television news channels ran footage almost nonstop. Television coverage did not call out the protesters on their casteism and allowed the viewers, most of them who opposed reservation, to frame a new narrative against it. The pro-reservation protests that were also taking place a few meters away barely received any coverage. After almost a month of coverage in print and TV news, the Supreme Court ordered the doctors to call off their strike on June 3rd, 2006. But the narrative had already been set. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And um, yeah, so um, Tane, can I get you to introduce your your piece from Incentorium and um, take it away? Yeah, I think I'm going to jump right in um, because the piece explains the book. I'm a writer, I'm a perfumer, and uh, this book merges those two practices. So let us begin at the end of the world. I sheltered in place in New York City where tens of thousands of my fellow city dwellers died of a virus. And in mid-April of the year 2020, I too became sick. For two weeks, I was immobile from fatigue and headaches and everything I ate came out of me as liquid and my sense of smell grew faint. My illness began on the eve of midnight when news from Taka, my maternal grandmother, Nanu, had a fever and seemed to be nearing the end of her life. Her breathing, her cries for her son who died, her sleeplessness, her prayer, and of course, her will that we should practice Islam were as familiar to me as a scent of her body. One of the first sensuous cartographies in my memory. Jasmine uther, violet talcum powder, bond juice, crushed rose powder, coconut oil, ponds cream, Tabasco sauce, canola oil. Nanu's tastes were village girl through and through. She loved a bright red lip, an attar of jasmine, a narcotic floral with an animal stink. 
After each meal, we watched her methodically prepare her fawn, feeling the beetle leaf with contents she kept in a metal tiffin. First, she stroked the leaf with white limestone paste, filled it with names that I read off the labels, Supari, Jamun Bahar, Jorda. I later learned the words in English, areca nut, rose powder, tobacco. These are all carcinogens, be damned. She went on to survive cancer twice, and this ritual brought her so much pleasure, she never stopped. As a Bangladeshi Muslim raised in the United States, I'm just two generations out of the village. I felt called to do right, to write, because of my grandmothers, both of them child brides, who lived as British, Indian, and Pakistani, and never had a say in shaping the world outside of their homes. My paternal grandmother did not live long enough to witness the birth of Bangladesh, a 50-year-old country at the time of this book's publication. Whereas a body cannot ex escape circumstance, in my mother's grandmother's case, she married at 13 and did not finish school and lost her son and husband at a young age. A perfume allows us to escape, even if only for a moment. When I heard news of her imminent death, I prayed for her to feel peace, to feel my love across the ocean. And she lay alone in a hospital room facing the indignity of her last moments on this earth without any of her children that she'd raised beside her. I sprayed myself with one of my perfumes, Night Blossom, an ode to the jasmine author that she wore. But I couldn't smell the jasmine notes in the perfume. I sprayed my wrists, my neck, nothing. I started hyperventilating, spraying perfume and spiraling. I can't smell, I can't smell, babe. She's gonna die alone and I'm gonna die alone and I can't smell anything. I cried, waking up my husband, Mustafa, who held me in his arms, guiding me through deep pranayamic breath to calm me down. Holding the pain of the world of New York dying, it felt unbearable. And for the next two weeks, I became so exhausted I could barely get up from my couch. I would just stare at the ceiling, unable to sleep, smell, or catch my breath. Perfume in Latin means through smoke, a reference to the sacred burning of incense and resin and woods that have defined spiritual practice since ancient times. And a perfume is a smoke signal that we wear on the body, a way to convey who we are while drawing a protective border between ourself and the outside world. A perfume is an object of imminence rooted in our physical world of raw materials used to transcend this world for the divine. As the ancients incensed their clothes with smoke of burned frankincense, embalmed the dead in oils of cedar and pine, wore garlands of jasmine and rose in Gandharva love ceremonies. Ancients during the plague wore pom pomander clove studded oranges and made herbal concoctions of saffron, turmeric, rose and orange water and not thought to stave off illness. And during my illness, the necessity of perfume became clear. I understood why humans needed the fragrant to survive the stench of our own filth in life and in death. And I understood why mass death made us yearn for beauty. And after genocide, like my people had lived through, beauty revives a possibility of survival. Throughout history, humans have divided themselves by odor and what they found putrescent versus pleasant. They have divided themselves between the sick and the healthy, the poor and the rich, the polluted and the pure, the slave and the master, the Dalit and the Brahmin. I wept seeing images of India, mass pyres in New Delhi, a city where I once lived, where millions of people died of a virus and lacked precious oxygen. A year before India's burning, I watched a brilliant conversation between Arundhati Roy and Imani Perry, hosted by Haymarket Books. Their mutual affection and expansive intellect lightened my mood while I was sick. Roy's essay, The Pandemic is a Portal, illuminated the intense planetary shift that we're living through this period of mass illness and death, of vast migrations of refugees and laborers, fleeing wars and gangs and climate change to make passage to new homes. People think the realm of the imagination is not material, but everything is material, said Perry. And I thought about how my connection to ancestors continues through material culture, textiles, jewelry, photographs, perfumes, remembrances that have been spared despite war and migration. Everything I write and say comes from communal wisdom, said Roy. And I felt her words deeply, gathering the knowledge for this book, felt like weaving eons of such wisdom into a massive textile of words. I grabbed her essay collection, The End of Imagination. I wanted to reread the title essay, remembering the solace I had once found in her image of another world being possible, one that we could hear breathing waiting for us. I wanted this relief as I struggled to catch my own breath. But then I opened Arundhati Roy's book and immediately I noticed the void. On the map of India, every single Indian state in South Asian country is named, but not Bangladesh. 
there's just an open blank space, a niche, empty. Bangladesh is a 10 letter word. It's too long for its own borders on this map that made sure we know it was not to scale, but didn't even bother to name us. And for most of my childhood in the 1980s, no one had ever heard of Bangladesh and the erasure brought up an old feeling of illegibility, invisible. Maps make borders real. And on this map, Bangladesh didn't matter. Bangladesh didn't exist. As if generations of our people who lived as Indian, British, Pakistani didn't fight or die for India's independence. As if they had not labored to build India's economy and wealth for centuries. As, this, as if this land where India's rivers could be separated from the rivers and dams that, the, that Roy has so written fe so fiercely about. As if the women-led garment workforce and rural microfinancing had not shaped modern South Asia's feminist future. As if the soil of East Bengal did not birth ways of divine feminine worship and as if we have not always been despised, maligned and erased by upper caste Brahmins as the Malekcha, the low caste, the Dalit, the Muslims, the barbarians. And as if the liberation war of 1971 or genocide and rape by the Pakistan army never happened, as if the rise of fascism and communal violence against minorities does not turn people into refugees there too. And as if the cyclones, floods and famines do not come for Bangladesh first. Borders are rife with violence but also longing. And as we move through this portal, we face truths that break through our myths and the cracks and lies in our systems are being exposed. This is the end game of colonialism and late capitalism. No greater myth than the free market was, uh, no, there is no greater myth than the free market built on racist legacies of slavery, sexual violence, police brutality, fascism and war once fueled by the British and European colonial conquest for fragrant spices. Would I ever find my people's histories if I kept looking for them in upper caste narratives by Indians? As Imani Perry sagely observed, stepping through the portal is releasing one's attachment to that which dominates. This book reimagines a release from that which dominates. I write this book into the void on that map, holding at its center the frontier that my people hail from, long considered profane by Brahmin priests and Mughal conquerors, a land where Buddhist and Hindu kingdoms once flourished before Islam became the dominant faith, a land that holds memories of ancient opulence, an ancestral feminine and revolutionary history of India, a land severed by multiple partitions and renamings, East Bengal, East Pakistan, and as of 50 years ago, since 1971, Bangladesh, my grandmother had been a citizen of them all. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Thank you. That I, yeah, really blown away by both of those readings. Um, <clears throat> so that the reason um, we're we're here to talk is, is to talk about memoir and to talk about truth because I think um, I think there's so much truth on on the page that we have all um, that we've all kind of led to, to, to conjure. And, and I'm curious about this idea of the intended reader. You know, it's some, something that we think about a lot in, I guess, when we teach creative writing is who is this for? And the, the reason I wanted to pose this first is because the, sub, the subtitle for In Sensorium is Notes for My People. And I think that is one of the most powerful sub, like subheadings for, for a memoir that I've seen in, in, in a really long time. And I, I wondered if both of you could just explore for me your, your intended reader for, for these books, book, books, books, um, who, who, you, who you're hoping to kind of um, get to read them and what you hope they take from it. Um, should we start with you, Yashika? Sure, absolutely. This is a question that I have had to think long and hard about. And it's a question that ultimately, in many ways, I'm still paying the price for. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But let's start with my reader first. When I was writing this book, um, I had to think about many things. One of them was that I am writing this book in English. And English has been this language that has been a bridge that has been one of the only ways in which um, Dalits have known to transcend their caste. One of the reasons that I am here standing in, sitting in front of you having this conversation is because I speak English in ways that Dalits are not supposed to speak English. I write English in ways that Dalits are not supposed to write English in. And, and when I was writing this book in English, I had to think long and hard about how do I, exactly what Tanae's book said, 
notes to my people. That is the same idea that I had. I was writing this book for Dalits. I was writing this book for my mother who struggled her entire life with wanting to speak English without her regional accent, who struggled her entire life to transcend her caste to this language that was never her own, but somehow was a marker for dignity that was robbed from her. So when I was writing Coming Out as Dalit, I had to think about how do I write in a way that is instantly accessible and reaches out to that person, maybe even myself, several years ago when I was 15, and I didn't understand how to defend myself when I was being told that I was grabbing someone else's seat in a certain school or college, or when I was being told that Dalits are people who don't have any merit, have any merit. Dalits are people who don't have any talent. Dalits are people who don't belong in spaces like universities and classes and, and, and they're just grabbing the resources that belong to somebody else. So when I started writing Coming Out as Dalit, I had to think about myself at 15 and whether this book will make sense to somebody who's growing up in a small town, trying to hide their caste, struggling with learning how to speak English in the most perfect, poised manner. Will this book make sense to them? And you know, having grown up in India, then coming to the, to the US, coming to Columbia Journalism School, learning how to write for a certain audience, I had a choice. I could write the way people are supposed to write when they come out of the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is literary, which is poetic, which is beautiful, and which is a way in which I can certainly write but I could also write in a way that would make sense to my mother, to myself at 15, to a child who is currently 15 years old, 14 years old, about to uh, appear for a com competitive examination in India, who is about to be bullied for their caste. I wanted this book to make sense for them first, which is why, and I know we have a question coming about process. I wrote this book thrice over. Once I wrote it in a way that I wanted to write it. The second time I wrote it for the editors, for the publishers in the United States who would see this book from India about a subject that they know nothing about and will pick it up only for its literary merit. And the third time I wrote this book for my people. I wrote it for that Dalit child who, who will be able to read this and say, I identify. This is my story too. Who's able to feel less alone just because I wrote something in the world. And that's why I think words have so much power and we need to stop making them an elitist pursuit. My reader is the 15 year old Dalit student who's about to get bullied and who knows how to stand up for themselves. And the fact that it has worked, I know this has worked, because my Instagram DMs are flooded with kids who say, thank you for writing this. Because now we identify that there is somebody like us out there and it does make us feel less alone. So, yeah. Thank you so um, much for that answer. Yeah. Really, really powerful. And Tanae, could, could, uh, could you, uh, the same question to you, if you could expand on that. Because it, it is like, I was really taken by really arrested by by that subtitle, I think it's so powerful and so it's and it, it's so evocative of your work and also of of your voice as well. You know, it's something. It's it's such a powerful affirming statement. Uh, thank you so much, Yashika's words really resonating with me. I f I feel so lucky that we can be in conversation because I think there is a lot of mediation in the larger imagination of literature. Um, that is dominated by Brahmin voices in, in an Indian centric way. And that as a Bengali Muslim person, I definitely grew up, you know, consuming that as literature. So the experience of never seeing myself in literature or film, that is beautiful work, but still not representative of my people really compelled me to 
question, what would a book look like if I were writing for an American, Bangla, Muslim, femme reader? Very specific, highly niche. I'm from a highly niche place. What does that look like? And that being enough in and of itself. The other passage I had debated reading um, talked about something truthful to me, which is money. Now, you know, we're writing books, we're trying to get money, we're trying to get our coin, we're trying to get out there. Of the 30 plus people this book was sent to, what I read to you, there were only two people who wanted this book. Two women of color who are in their 20s who wanted this book because it's value based on the value that is given to South Asian literature in America was not perceived by the mostly white people in publishing. What does that do when you are up against that sort of erasure? When I have lived in this country my whole life. I am telling a story that is relevant, but what it is crackling with is a type of rage that you do not often read in works of literature and fiction. There is a deep rage growing up Muslim from a non-Indian South Asian group in this country. So for me, that liberated me once I accepted that that would be the lens. Cause I was like, well, my editor is the one who has my back. I'm going to write the book that I was meant to write and it's for my people. Does that include you? Yeah, you're my people because you are open-heartedly reading this book. Whoever chooses to read this book is my people. But how many panels have I been in with other writers who are coming from places of non-dominance? Have I been in panels with other writers who are Dalit, who are speaking about these issues? Not often, to be honest, because the milieu that I'm writing in often does not imagine us as part of that milieu. And we are asserting a place that is threatening to that sense of dominance. And I feel like when you talk about something that notes feel ephemeral to me, so in a similar way as Yashika is trying to make this readable for your mother, the young Dalit students who are 15, I too wanted that kind of accessibility but also realizing that in history, the thing that I call the patrimyth, the patriarchal myths that we are all living under, we as Muslims and Dalits and femmes and people who have been erased made that history. That our role has been erased on the record does not mean that we were not there all along. So to write in the face of such uh, myth is to kind of assert a place that has always been there. So I feel like it's like reclaiming, but also kind of um, I, I reject dominance in, in literature and, and take space that reimagines what literature looks like. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, part, part of my motivation in putting together this panel is to kind of acknowledge acknowledge my position and and privilege as you know as as a male as someone who's born into a brahmin family in in like in the west and and so on and so forth and and what what i really relish is the opportunity to kind of really highlight the amazing work that you guys are doing i just wanted to to, to just move on to um to the, these truths that you guys are talking about. I'm just, I'm gonna throw a quote at you from um, the writer Hilary Mantel. She wrote this in uh, specifically about writing historical fiction, but when I read it, it just, it really took my breath away because for me, it said everything about truth that, uh, and, um, and writing that, that I never thought. Bear with me, it's a bit of a long quote. <laughs> it's from her wreath lecture um, for anyone who's watching this who wants to go and seek it out evidence is always partial facts are not truth though they are part of it information is not knowledge and history is not the past it is the method we have evolved of organizing our ignorance of the past it's the record of what's left on the record it's the plan of positions taken when we stop to stop the dance to note them down and this is the bit i really love it's what's left in the sieve when the centuries have run through it a few stones, scraps of writing, scraps of cloth. It's no more the past than a birth certificate is a birth or a script is a performance or a map is a journey. It's the multiplication of the evidence of fallible and biased witnesses combined with the incomplete accounts of actions not fully understood by the people who perform them. It's no more than the best we can do and often it falls short of that. 
Now, obviously, she's 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 talking about this in reference to historical fiction, but uh, that that idea of um, truth running through the sieve of 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 the years of the decades, and you know, when when we when we sit down to record these things, when we sit down to archive these stories. Um, you know, our perspective changes and the times change how we view things that have happened in the past. And so I, I wondered if you could both talk a little bit about how how you wrestled with that and retaining the truth of, of what you've both talked about, you know, your intention in writing these books, how, how you managed to keep that on the page, knowing that the, year, the, you know, the way the years sort of shift our perspective of things can affect how we tell those stories. Can I come to you first, Tane? Um, Sure. I, I love that quote um, because working with fragrant materials, you literally are dealing with a material example of that. So it's really, really apt. And thank you for finding that. Um, you know, when you're reading history or texts that are very old, you catch glimpses of characters and stories that are often you know, just a couple of lines, a figment, a violent character uh, to be vanquished, uh, whatever. These are all kind of, you know, the myths that we are consuming. So you have to kind of really look for that particulate matter to get into that sieve to find yourself and to find your people. And anyone who has felt marginalized has that experience in whether, whatever context that you um, grow up in. So taking fragrant materials, you know, and, and talking about caste and thinking about, you know, these materials are used to demarcate purity and pollution and demarcate like ascension versus like just living in the scum of the earth. You're denying the fact that those materials were handled by all the people, not just the elevated, upper, whatever. It was handled by everyone. Everyone had access to these materials. And there's a, an incredible Dalit scholar uh, and Sanskrit scholar, Gumud Baude, who talks about all the fragrances she was accustomed to growing up. Um, and reading her, I was like, you were so taken by Sanskrit because you heard something in you that felt ancestrally connected to something that was happening in that moment because you were a part of that moment ancestrally, even though you are not supposed to be a part of that moment, you were erased from that moment. And part of her navigating, passing, coming out as Dalit is finding ways to live fragrantly and be fragrant. She's like, well, those people think I smell, but they actually smell and we actually, you know, are really trying to live our best life and like, you know, completely reject the things that are said about us for our caste. So I'm just bringing her as an example where there is such a confluence of different characters in history that when we look for the fragments and the scraps, what Saidiya Hartman calls, um, you know, the discarded fragments of history, that's where there's so much life you know, where things can germinate, the seeds that are collected, that can be planted again. That's kind of how I approached it. Because the myth is that you and I are separate, you're Indian and I'm Bangladeshi, but that's actually not how the land works. There is no separation actually in land. So to write is to really eschew this idea of separation, is to write in between those divides that actually are man-made. Um, so for me, it was a, a joy to collect the fragments of history to find the fragrant details from a Muslim perspective, a Dalit perspective, because they're there waiting for us. It's up to us as the writer to make those connections. And I think that that, you know, became very apparent to me in the process. I love that That's so much. Thank you so much. Yashka, can I bring you in on the same question, please? Absolutely. So first of all, Thank you for sharing this incredible quote. I have been reading it and rereading it in the past couple of days. It's such a beautiful line, right? Like what is left in the sieve of time and perspective, which means that, and, and if you read the, and I really encourage everybody who's listening, please go listen to that lecture or read the entire article on Guardian. It's quite incredible. It talks about how history is not just 
a record of facts. History might be a record of facts. Past is not. Past is so much more than that happened. We hear that Ambedkar and Gandhi signed the Pune Pact, as I've mentioned in my book. But what were they thinking? What was the context behind that? What did it take for somebody who was Ambedkar, who was a Dalit man, who was standing up to what, who was possibly the tallest leader in that part of the world at that point? What did it mean to go against the great Mahatma Gandhi? And how did he do that? What went through his mind when he was asking for absolute equality for Dalits versus Gandhi saying that you're children of God and you should be treated as such? And he said, I don't want to be mythological. I don't want to be godlike. I don't want to be childlike. I want to be human just like you. I want the same power that you want. And when I was writing this book, these are the questions that I was thinking about. You know, similarly, you know, there is this historical narrative, which I relied a lot in the book, but there's also personal narrative because the book is so deeply related to my life. And one of the things that I realized after reading this brilliant article by Hilary Mantle was how, uh, you know, and, and then I talked about ancestral connections, how for me, they have been really prominent throughout my life. This one particular incident that I talk about, my great grandfather learning how to read and write by scrawling a stick in the mud. And that's because we weren't allowed to touch books. The, the pollutant was the person, you know, and if you touched a slate or a pencil or a book, that, was, that became polluted and a Brahmin person, an upper class person couldn't touch it. That's why we weren't allowed to read and write. In effect, that was a way to control power. And that particular moment, when I think about it and played in my mind a lot, was what did my great grandfather feel like when it was, you know, when Hillary Mantle talks about what's the context behind a certain point or perspective? How did he feel like? Stand, sitting outside the class and scrawling a stick in the mud when everyone else is writing on sl slate and chalk. What does it mean? What does that determination look like to overcome that? How, how hungry do you have to be to be educated, to want to be educated, to want to go to school when the best they can do for you is make you sit outside and scrawl a stick in the mud? And, you know, this is a question that I wrestled with throughout the memoir in my personal life as well. Um, there were incidents that completely stood out to me. And as we know, memory is just remembering. Memory is never accurate. So throughout the book, I wanted to create the history, of course, which is not to say the life events in my book aren't accurate. They are completely accurate. But I also wanted to give people, the reader, a felt sense, a lived sense of what does it mean to occupy this body and this mind where you have to hide yourself, when you are living in hiding, where you inherit this idea that you are lesser than and lower than, when, you, um, when you've been gaslit into believing into your lowerness, when you, when you are so convinced that you are not equal and how do you overcome that? Those were, you know, I wanted to convey that sense and which is why, you know, when we talk about the sieve of time and perspective, of course, my book is littered with facts. And I wanted to do that because I didn't want upper caste academics to challenge it because it was factually incorrect. It's something that happens to Dalits a lot. Um, upper caste people challenging them on their ideas, that is. Um, but I also wanted to convey to people what it means to be living in this Dalit woman's body who has been forced to hide herself and who genuinely believes that she is not equal to a Brahmin person and has to do everything it takes to overcome that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it brings me on nicely to, to the next question I wanted to ask, because I do think that sometimes uh, writing memoir can come at quite a personal cost in terms of, you know, having to relive painful things to, to put them on the page. And, and there, there becomes like a, a delicate balance between, you know, putting your pain on the page, but also trying to find joy as well. And I, and I wondered if you could both talk a little bit about the stuff that the stuff that gave you joy and the stuff that caused you pain. Um, should we start with you, Yashika, and then we'll come to you, T. 
Um, I do have to say, joy for me with the book only came in hindsight. This is a labor of pain through and through. And that makes you wonder why I ever bothered to write the book if it was so painful. It's because when you have a book inside of you, it needs to come out. And that was really, that's exactly what happened with me. I got the, um, the book deal and I knew I needed to write this because even with the website documents of Dalit discrimination and the work I was putting out there, I was getting the feedback that something like this didn't exist, but there was a huge craving for this kind of assertion of people's Dalit identities, the Dalit identity of a woman in particular, of a Bhangi woman. I come from a manual scavenging family and the name given to my caste is Bhangi, which is uh, the lowest of the low castes. So, um, you know, it was a deeply painful process because I never wanted to write a book when I was growing up. And it's not because, because of any other reason. It's because growing up in India in the 90s and 2000s, all you saw around you, and I've already spoken about the, the prominence of English in our milieu, but all you saw were upper caste writers, whether it was Roy, whether it was Amitabh Ghosh, whether it was Kiran Desai, all these names were really upper caste, out of reach, elite. And I did not see a connection between me and them. There was no way that there was a bridge between how I inhabited the world and the world that they lived in. So I never even considered that I could write a book that somebody like me could have a voice. In the early 2000s and the 90s when I was growing up, that was not a possibility. We didn't have voices. I did not, bhangis didn't talk. And if we did, we talked in Hindi, so we could be easily marginalized. We talked in regional languages. We didn't talk in English. So when I decided to write this book, it was, it was um, something that I needed to get out. And it, and it came at a great cost because I was a new immigrant in the country under the Trump administration. And thanks to the visa laws, I was not uh, you know, easily hireable either. So I was scrambling with, for money. I was working freelance jobs. I was working 10 to 6, writing 6 to 9 every weekday. And um, it, was, it was a labor of pain is what I have to, is what I will say. And um, especially the, the traumatic events, um, I, I felt that revisiting them really was cathartic. It helped me put the pain to rest. But also, I thought it was a little unfair that the only way it was for people to pay attention to a Dalit woman's work is to have her bleed on the page. They had to see our pain to believe us. And I gave it to them. And of course, we bled on the page. I bled on that page. But the cost that it took on me was enormous. I I don't think I have another book in me just yet because that question does come a lot. And I gave everything I had to this book in terms of the process, in terms of writing and rewriting it. And um, in terms of, yeah, th there was enormous pain when it came to writing coming out as Dalit. And for the longest time, I did not know where it would go, but I did know that it would engender some hope. The joy came afterwards. The joy came when, when I heard from people, when I heard from the exact 15-year-old that I was writing for. Those, it, reached, it reached out to those children in, in small towns in India and the diaspora and, and South Asia in general, where people read the book, understood what it was saying, and used it. I wrote this book as a guide and as a manual. And when I heard that, that's what brought me joy. And the other aspect where I was able to celebrate or feel joyful was reading Ambedkar throughout the research process. And like I mentioned earlier, it was the first time after having believe, believed in my own lesserness, if I can say that, in my own inequality, in the fact that I didn't belong in these spaces, reading somebody who asserted our equality with such uh, defiance was, uh, was a moment of recognition for me. That was when 
I realized that this is a myth that I've been believing in. And this is an arbitrary, fictitious system that does not make any sense. So I think one of the one moment of joy while writing was reading Ambedkar. And all the joy for me really came much later. The book was purely pain. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, and thank you, thank you also for writing it as, as well. Uh, Tane, can I um, ask you the same question? I totally concur with the pain aspect. <laughs> uh, so the heart of this book, um, being from a country that is very like marked by violence, um, I wanted to go right to that violence, and that's the war that my parents lived through, that's why they came here. It's a whole narrative that is different from um, a migration story to find a better life. There's another aspect to that that I wanted to reach and touch. And part of that research was encountering a lot of survivor testimony um, and genocide testimony and trauma. And those are very, very gutting testimonies to read and on top of the illness taking that in it took a toll on my physical body um, and the way that I structured the process there are parts that break up these the book is structured as a perfume so when you're making a perfume you lay down the base notes that are the thickest notes and that is a metaphor for the historic kind of relationships that I'm discussing in the book. And the heart notes are the parts that bloom when you put the perfume on the skin. And those are the survivor testimonies of femmes who were raped in a horrible war that took the lives of millions of people. And the top is this sort of move into healing and spirituality. Mirror mirroring that um, kind of research and reading, I excavated from my own life being a survivor, being someone who has been in situations that have made me feel unsafe and violated. So that coupled with what I was researching, it's like kind of mirroring the history that I'm researching and writing about in the excavation of my own life in a memoir, what I'm gutting from myself to give that to the reader I had to temper that. And part of doing that was creating interludes um, where I just deal with fragrant materials. And it's not the same in a Western way of understanding perfume that kind of talks about transcendence as the point of a perfume. I call perfume an object of imminence rooted in the material conditions of this world. So how do we take these materials and root them in actual memories that I have that have lightness and joy, as well as the pain of the world in one breath, in one inhalation. So for me, it was like, one was not extricable from the other. To be finished, I feel tons of joy. Uh, we'll see how the book is re received. It feels good to hear from Yashiga, like on the other side of publishing. This is my first foray into nonfiction for, uh, in book form at least. So I, I await how it will be read and received. and that's like holding my breath until that happens. So I think the pain um, is part of the process. It, it should hurt, I think, if you're going into your memory and ancestral memory. I mean, it does hurt to uh, talk about the injustices that our people have experienced. So I'm grateful for being able to survive that and to be able to, to do right and to write, as I say, you know. Great, thank you. So, so my final question to you both, and uh, I'll let you both go back to your, the holidays that I've interrupted. Yeah. Um, give, this this event is called the Stories We Tell, and I, just, I wanted to ask what what compels you to tell the stories that you tell. I mean, you you both, you know, today you write fiction and nonfiction. You write essay. Yashika, you're a journalist as well as um, being a memoirist, um, and it, yeah, it'll be great to hear from you what what at your core compels you to tell these stories? Should we start with you, Tane, and then we'll go to you, Yashika? Sure. You know, the title in Sensorium, Sensorium is one of those academic words that kind of started popping off, you know, like haptic or, you know, there's these words. Uh, so Sensorium 
it came to me as sort of an elegy for this world that is undergoing intense climate transformation and change. And we can partially blame our quest for fragrant materials for the destruction of our planet. So for me, I'm a documentarian. And what compels me is documenting this embodiment on this time in this time on earth that is so rapidly showing us how fragile every system is, every institution is sort of being unraveled. And if I didn't write this, someone else would write their story. I mean, I'm not the only person. I do come from collective wisdom and knowledge, but I am moved by how language finds us and we deepen our grasp of language when we fuse it with body. There is such a resistance. I mean, writing in English, reading American novels, British novels, like taking all that in growing up, there's such a resistance to showing the embodiment of someone who is dark skin, brown, feminine, emotional, passionate. That is not a character that is ever rendered in a way. Let me not say it's never rendered. It is rendered by us who are invested in rendering this character, but it has not often been. Um, the, I, I encountered the first Bangladeshi characters reading Zadie Smith White Teeth. I mean, come on, that was 2000. I was already like an adult at that point in English, I'm saying. So I feel very called to this canon of now, this canon of today, this canon of literature that is, you know, asserting our sensuousness and asserting our embodiment because we have been rendered ridiculous, mute and invisible otherwise. So how dare that happen? How dare that be our only, um, the way that we are represented? So I don't know. I will continue to do that until my last breath. <laughs> Thank you. And Yashika. Um, why do I tell the stories I tell? Well, um, if I may take you back a little bit, and this is a question I haven't answered anywhere. So this is interesting for me to think about as well. Um, I became a journalist as a way to access this magic around this language that is English. And I grew up reading magazines, uh, the fashion magazines that my mom bought because that was our way into upper caste culture that was so heavily guarded from us. And both my parents insisted that I write good English, that I speak good English. And I knew that I wanted to, to do something with my life when it, you know, with writing. And like I mentioned earlier, writing a book was such an elitist pursuit at that time. And journalism seemed somewhat accessible. So that's how I got into journalism. That's how I got in the business of telling stories. But when I became a journalist, I realized that I deeply enjoyed putting on paper that what is not told. A lot of the stories that we are see are, you know, overlooking um, the, the inner lives of a lot of people. There's a story about you know, a construction worker who rarely looks into their inner life. There's a story about Dalit people killed, rarely looks into their inner lives. So I was deeply invested in the idea of what's going on in their heads. How are they feeling? What is this character? What is this person? How, how do they feel? How do they live? What do, how do they make sense of this world around them? And that was my prime motivation as a journalist, at least, you know, and, and until I moved to the US as well. And after I started writing the book, my motivation was to make people feel less alone, if I do say that myself. Because when I was growing up, nothing like this literature existed around me. I wish it did, because then I would know that there are ways to be other than what I'm being taught to be. There are ways to exist as equals. There are ways to assert my caste with pride. There are ways to um, think of myself as not inherently inferior to a Brahmin person. And 
this book was written solely with the intention of reaching out to people and letting them know that you're not alone. Your story is not the only one. There are so many like us. And to sort of build a canon of of Dalit identity that is based and rooted in pride and not explaining ourselves to upper caste as to why caste is a reality. It was created with the idea for me to, to be unabashedly Dalit and you know, not really, not to not present myself in the way I'm supposed to present myself, and not to not feel the shame that I'm supposed to feel. So yeah, that was my main. That's why I tell the stories so that people feel less alone. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you both of you. Uh, we've come to the end. Uh, of of this incredible conversation, I feel like we could go on and on and on. Um, we're, we're we're lucky to have you both. Is all, all I can say. Thank you for telling the stories that you do, and long may you continue. Um, for those of you who are watching this, what you need to do right now is go and buy coming out as as Dalit right now, or wherever you get your books, and pre order in Sensorium. Pay that hefty import price if you are. <laughs> If you are based in the UK, uh, because as of yet, as of yet, um, pray that we sell in the UK. <laughs> yes. Um, so please go and get those books. Uh, thank you so much to Tane and to Yashika Dutt for coming out as Dalit is not available in the UK or the US, unfortunately. So there are publishers out there. You could, you can buy, I did contact buy it. On, I did buy it on. I hate to say the A word, but I did buy it on the A word. I, I, I yes you uh, you can buy it on Kindle on the A word because I did. on the A word I, that I, you can uh, yeah. that's available yeah, yeah. Um, sorry to say. yeah so, <laughs> so if you have Kindles you can go and buy it and read it in the next ten minutes but thank you so much both of you for your time thank you to Tidefest for giving us the space to have this conversation um, also there is more there are more events happening this weekend Tide fest is happening tomorrow as well and there are events on the website um on the tide website that you can go and check out they are all free and uh thank you to nandini das and to, to the tide team for making my my year as a writer in residence on this project so enlightening and beautiful and for, for allowing me to have lots of brilliant slightly off the wall conversations about all these things that i'm interested in thank you to Tanay and to yashka and to all of you for watching goodbye everyone go buy books bye thank you for having us thank you take care bye